Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Long Mars by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. So this is book number three in the Long Earth series, which I've been reading through. I will give you the blurb and a few quick impressions, and then we'll crack on and go through some of my flags. So, The Long Earth is in chaos. The cataclysmic aftermath of the Yellowstone eruption is shutting civilization down. As populations flee to the relative safety of stepwise Earths, Sally Lindsay, Joshua Valiente and Lobsang do what they can to assist in the perilous cleanup. But Joshua is called to a crisis closer to home. A newly emergent breed of young, super bright post-humans threatens the status quo of normal human society and violent confrontation seems inevitable. And now Sally has been contacted by her long-vanished father, Willis Lindsay, the maverick inventor of the original stepper device. He is planning a fantastic voyage and wants her to join him, but what is his true motivation? For mankind and the long earth itself, a dangerous new adventure is beginning. So, again, this is book three and... I feel as though this is suffering with what, what most series end up suffering with, where for me the first book was absolutely fantastic and it's just kind of lost momentum through books two and now book three. Uh, but having said that, what is cool about this is that we go to Mars and we have a space mission that's kind of enabled by the Long Earths. Basically, there's a gap in between, it's called the gap between different versions of the Earth. So as you step from one reality to another, suddenly there's one where the Earth isn't there. But for space travel, that's pretty handy because they can just go straight into, you know, free fall through deep space as opposed to having to break out of the Earth's atmosphere. So in this book, they head to Mars and then they discover that you can also step on Mars. And so they start exploring all these alternate realities of Mars. What, what sort of happens between each of these books is that there's a period of time elapses. Uh, and so in this one... You know, some stuff's happened, so Joshua has separated from his wife, uh, his estranged wife, and uh, we start here in the year 2045, 30 years after Step Day, so that's 30 years after the first book. One of the things I like about these books is I feel as though I'm learning while I'm reading them, and there's just a bit of dialogue here, which I didn't realise was true, but it makes sense, because both are every four years, so someone says, Captain, it's November in a leap year. This is the time we hold a presidential election. Is what we do in America, super volcano or not. So that makes it a lot easier for me to keep track of when the American elections will be. There's also a lot of little bits where we kind of get an insight into what the world has become. So we have here, um, yes, America would need Chinese rice for the foreseeable future. But Maggie could see that the challenge was going to be to stop friends like China using the disaster to gain a permanent foothold in American society. Already there had been rumours that the Chinese were running tobacco into a nicotine-starved datum America, like the, op like the opium wars in reverse, she thought. And I think all these things, they are, like, believable as well, which is what makes them so interesting. And basically, at the end of the last book, there was a big ex eruption at Yellowstone, and that's caused everybody to flee our world to go into the stepwise worlds, which are the ones, you know, the ne nearest worlds nearby, and... Um, this character called Cowley says, It will be a movement of people to dwarf the biblical exodus. It will be an opening up of a new frontier that will make the expansion into the Old West look like clearing my grandmother's front yard. But we are Americans. We can do this. We can and will build a new America fit for purpose. And I can tell you this. Just as I promised you that nobody will be left behind under the shadow of that infernal ash, so I promise you now, in the difficult seasons ahead, nobody will go hungry. And then we have Lobsang. Lobsang is the supercomputer, and I think this little exchange here between Joshua and uh, one of the one of the nurses, uh, one of the nuns, I'm sorry, for the the home where he grew up, and he actually saved this girl in the first book, and now she's all grown up as well. But anyway, Joshua grunted. I remember Lobsang predicting a super eruption more than once. Blowups like that accounted for some of the jokers we found out in the Long Earth, the disaster blighted worlds. But he didn't see Yellowstone coming. Sister John shook her head. In the end, he had no more insight than the geologists on whose faulty data he had to rely, and he couldn't have stopped it anyhow. But that doesn't make him feel any better, even though he is technically a computer, but he's also... So he's a computer with the soul of a Buddhist... Tibetan Buddhist motorcycle repairman inside. The uh, exodus from our world is so bad that uh, there's a, a plan to have... Uh, there's a plan to save cultural treasures by stepping them away although there would be a globally distributed, internationally supported museum of the datum in the stepwise worlds, the government's promised. So nothing will be lost. Although some things will be lost, because you can't step from world to world with anything containing iron. So anything made out of iron, screwed. And we have this interesting sort of theological take as well. So people, 
a kind of saying that the the any of the worlds that you step to are fallen places, the devil's work, because Jesus never walked there. Nelson had read up on this in preparation for meeting Eileen. In a way, it had been an extension of old arguments about whether inhabitants of other planets could be regarded as saved or not, if Christ had been born only on Earth. Out in the long Earth, as far as anybody knew, no humans had evolved anywhere beyond Datum Earth. So Christ's incarnation had surely been unique to Datum Earth. In fact, the body of Christ himself had been uniquely composed of atoms and molecules from the Datum. So what was the theological status of all those other Earths? What of the children already being born on worlds of the long Earth? Their very bodies composed of atoms that had nothing to do with the world of Christ. Were they saved by his incarnation or not? So I do think it's cool how the authors have thought of like every conceivable angle, you know? And so then Sally gets recruited by her father, who is also the guy who created the technology that allows stepping. And they kind of, them hatching these plans to go into space. And we have a little red dwarf reference here, which I enjoyed. They were met at the compound gate by a guy her father introduced as Al Ra. While his scale was shaven, a thick black beard sprouted from his chin, giving Sally the odd impression that his head had been rotated around the axis of his stub nose and reattached upside down. He wore canvas shorts, grubby sneakers with no socks, and a black t-shirt too small for his belly with a faded slogan, Smoke me a kipper. I'll be back for breakfast. There's an auditorium called the Robert A. Heinlein Auditorium, which I think is like a touching little tribute there. And basically, so Wallace Lindsay says to Sally, he says... He wants to go to Mars because it's a long Mars and you can step there. And she, she says, how do you know? No, don't answer that. And it's kind of implied he just like he's figured these things out. Actually, I guess there is a reason how, why he knows, which is revealed a little bit later. But also he says that there's going to be intelligent life. He says not on Mars, on a Mars. And he's not discovered it. He's deduced the necessary existence of it. And then they uh, go along with a guy called Frank Wood and... Uh, He's kind of tragic almost in this way. It says here, In 2045, Francis Paul Wood, USAF retired, was 61 years old, and flying in space had been his dream since boyhood. As a kid, he'd been an odd mix of sports jock, engineering hobbyist and dreamer. He was encouraged by his parents and an uncle who wrote about the space program and loaned him a library of old science fiction, from Asimov to Clement and Clark and Herbert. But by the time his dream started to take realistic shape, the Challenger crash was already history, a disaster that had happened when he was two years old. Still, he'd progressed. Once he'd been a NASA candidate astronaut, a career development after active service in the Air Force. He'd got that close. Then came Step Day, when an infinity of worlds had opened up within walking distance of an unequipped human, and spaceships had become instant museum pieces. And so had Frank Wood, it felt like, at 31 years old. He'd become restless, nostalgic, and without a close family, having sacrificed relationships for a dream of a career. Suddenly he found that he'd become the uncle with the connections to the space program and a trunk full of science fiction novels. There's some more good stuff about Frank here, actually. Burdened by a sense of opportunities lost, he'd spent some years hanging around what remained of Cape Canaveral, doing whatever work he could find. But Canaveral, aside from a continuing program of launches of small unmanned satellites, was little more than a decaying museum of dreams. And then had come the discovery of the Gap, a place where a conjunction of cosmic accidents had left a hole in the chain of worlds that was the long Earth, and a new kind of access to space. A few years after that, Frank, by then in his 50s, had gone out there to find a bunch of kids and young at heart types busily building an entirely new kind of space programme, based on an entirely new principle. Frank had thrown himself into the project with enthusiasm, and liked to think he injected a modicum of wisdom and experience into what had felt, in those early days, like some kind of ongoing science fiction convention, and these days more like the gold rush. What's interesting is actually in the notes for the first book, they do mention that a lot of the work for the first book was done at a Discworld convention. So it's a nice little nod back to its own conception there. I think this is quite cool as well when we consider Lobsang as a piece of AI. Or again, perhaps Lobsang himself was actually aging in his own way. After all, nobody knew what would happen to an artificial intelligence as it grew older, as its substrate turned into a thing of layers of increasingly elderly technologies, both hardware and software, accreting like a coral reef, as Lobsang had once put it. And as its own inner complexity grew ever more tangled, it was an, it was an experiment nobody had ever run before. We have a reference here to uh, the Hindenburg disaster, which I've always found kind of fascinating, I don't know why, and like the old newsreel footage of it. But um, yeah, it's because, you know, the government and the black corporation are working together to create these new uh, airships that can go exploring ever further into the long earth. The two brand new Navy craft, the USS Neil A. Armstrong II and the USS Eugene A. Cernan, were whales in the sky. 
their predecessors, including Maggie's own old commander, Franklin, based on long Mississippi commercial Twain technology, had been a little smaller than the venerable Hindenburg. The new Armstrong, like its sister, was nearly half as long again, topping out at more than a thousand feet from stem to stern, not counting a protruding comms antenna and massive tailplanes mounted with compact jet engines. The crew liked to brag about how that great envelope could swallow the old Franklin Hall, though that wasn't quite true. But, with Cernan, the ship had taken the record for the largest flying machine ever constructed from the old Hindenburg. Mac had counselled Maggie not to boast too loudly about that, because after all the Hindenburg had been bankrolled by the Nazi party, and ultimately had crashed and burned. Maggie had pored over the engineering details as the ships had been designed and constructed, like a kid in a toy store. Now her heart swelled with pride that two such magnificent ships were hers to command. So one of the missions that the, I think it's the Neil Armstrong 2, in fact the two new ships they both go on is to try and get to like 200 million steps away and also to see what happened to the crew of the Neil Armstrong 1 and we do get to see that later. I like here Lobsang's idea as well of making himself immortal by having, uh, he says, Oh, a few hundred monks in a scriptorium somewhere, endlessly copying my thoughts from one bound paper volume to another. Although he's joking, but it's an idea, isn't it? And like an analog AI. And then Lobsang and Joshua are talking about that there's a great deal of work to do before Datum is even safe because on our world there was this huge Yellowstone eruption. So Joshua says, such as decommissioning nuclear power plants and waiting for dams to fail, for drained wetlands to flood. It will take decades, centuries for pollutants like heavy metals and radioactive waste to be reduced to safe levels. Even then, where we have driven roads or dug mines into the bedrock, the mark of mankind will linger for millions of years. Makes you proud, if you say so, Joshua. We, and then we have this breed of like home, like Homo sapiens evolved called the Next, and they, they're quite often from happy landings. I don't want to say too much about them because their origin ex story is kind of explained in this. But they're much smarter than we are and could like, you know, play us all. I think this is interesting as well, which is kind of a nod back to the culture here. So uh, Lobsang is talking about his death and he says, uh, and he says he remembers it. My last human death and my reincarnation. Joshua thought that over. So was it like when Doctor Who regenerates? No, Joshua, Lobsang said with strained patience. It was not like when Doctor Who regenerates. I remember it, Joshua, I think. The lamentations of the women in the kitchen where the Chikai Bardo came, the moment of my death. The Tibetans believe that the soul lingers in the dead body. So for 49 days, the Book of the Dead is read over the corpse to guide the soul through the bardos, the phases of existence that bridge life and death. I remember the reading by my friend Padmasambhava. Even the book itself, I looked down on it from outside my body, the sheets printed from hand-carved blocks held between wooden covers. I was dead, I was told. Everybody who came before me had died. That I had to recognise my own true nature, the radiant, pure light of continuing consciousness inside the heavy physical body, and with that recognition, liberation would be instantaneous. But after 21 days of chanting, if liberation hasn't come, you enter the Sidpa Bardo, the Bardo of rebirth. You become like a body without substance. You can roam the whole world, tirelessly, seeing all, hearing all, knowing no rest, yet you are haunted by images from your former life. Now think about that and look at me, Joshua. I am spread across all the worlds of the long earth. I see all, I hear all. What does that sound like but the bardo of rebirth? But to pass on, you have to abandon all you have known in this life. How can I do that? Sometimes I fear I am trapped in the Sidpa bardo, Joshua, that I am trapped between death and rebirth, that I am never, in fact, been reincarnated, reborn at all. So he says here, this, this gives us quite an insight about the two of them, the two Lindsays. Willis Lindsay, imme Willis Lindsay immediately disappeared into his own agenda of research and experimentation, using the computer gear and small laboratory he had installed on his personal deck. He seemed entirely unperturbed by being thrown into interplanetary space. His daughter, meanwhile, a solitary type too, withdrew into herself. She slept a lot, exercised ferociously over and above the required minimum, read for hours using the onboard e-library she'd helped stock. Willis Lindsay played a lot of music, Chuck Berry, Simon and Garfunkel. This antique stuff, echoing around the lab module, seemed to disturb Sally. Frank guessed this was the soundtrack of her childhood, and not particularly welcome to have back. This is interesting as well because, again, because this is the gap where the Earth has been destroyed, uh, they're, talk they're looking out at it, and, sh and uh, Sally says, asteroids, right? Yeah, you can see something similar at home, I mean in the skies of the datum, but there's more asteroids here, a whole extra band actually, between the orbits of Venus and Mars. She thought that over. Oh, the wreckage of dead earth. 
the planet Belos smashed. That's it. But it's not wasted. We're out there already, in little dinky rocket ships, mining those fragments of planet for water, hydrocarbons, even iron from what used to be the Earth's core. Easily accessible. And we're manufacturing rocket fuel. Eventually, the plan is, we'll be independent of materials brought over from the stepwise world altogether. Some people are planning to live out there, on the asteroids themselves. Mind you, others find it kind of morbid that we're feeding off the ruins of a devastated world. So as we're getting further and further away from the datum and more steps away, we start to see like different styles of evolution. So I'm going to read this here. Uh, but, where the, uh, but where the Armstrong traveled now, things got weirder. Maggie learned that there had been another milestone mass extinction on Datum Earth more than 200 million years before humanity had arisen. A community crowded with the first mammals, early dinosaurs and the ancestors of crocodiles had been smashed. Now, millions of steps from the Datum, they found the consequence of different outcomes of that epochal event. Jumbled ecologies where mammalian hunters track dinosaur-like herbivores or insectile predators chase crocodilian prey. There were worlds with crocodiles the size of tyrannosaurs or raptors the size of mice with teeth like needles. Oh yeah, then we get these crab people, <laughs> and all I could think of was crab people, crab people. What did she see? Those little mats, pale brown in colour, were craft, woven of some kind of reed, purposefully constructed. They reminded her of big table mats. The seaward ones seemed to be flowing with the current, but those heading upstream were attached by fine thread to more crabs on the bank of the little canal. Bigger beasts than those she'd seen on the seaweed farms, hefty, clumsy, labouring to pull their threads. She looked closer and made out more of the smaller crabs. Each of the big haulage animals had at least one little crab beside him with a pincer holding. What, a whip? Something like that. And on each of the rafts themselves rode another little crab or two, and they held hands and they held handles in their pincers which controlled a kind of rudder. And then we get to see them a little a little bit closer. Maggie bent down to see who was emerging from the spit and shell palace. One big crab in the centre of the party was surely the centrepiece of it all. His shell wasn't marked, but he looked heavy, older, even indefinably arrogant to Maggie. He was surrounded by a circle of odd-looking acolytes, pink, vulnerable-looking. My god, she said, they have no shells. Hemingway said, maybe they've just molted. When it molts, the whole crab has to climb out of its old shell. Of course, these companions look the right size to be females. In some crab species, the females are mated just after molting when they're softer. Hmm. I wonder if this emperor has some way to keep his harem from forming new shells, thus keeping them sexually available for whenever he feels the urge. It's a horrible thought. Ugh. Crab people, crab people. And then just as the Americans arrive on the long Mars and go to plant the flag, uh, the Russians show up and they got there first, which I think is great. I like this explanation here as well. So, so uh, I never even knew the Russians were exploring the gap. He grinned. His, he was about 40, his face was leathery, crumpled, sweat-crusted after hours behind a face mask, and his black greasy hair was a tangle. Gap space, cowboy outfit in England. Don't know about Russians, not interested to look. Of course Russians are here. We have base on world on other side of Gap, on Baltic coast, high latitude, called Star City. Like university campus and manufacturing plant and military base all in one. Also Chinese here, though not so much. Mostly don't know about each other. How would we know? Big empty earths, no spy satellites. What difference if one here or all? Gap is door to big universe. Which is true. And then uh, the steppers are slightly different on Mars. So the only difference from a thousand such boxes she'd seen before, from tangles lashed up by teenagers to sleek bulletproof models issued to cops and military, was that there was no potato in here. The earthy, almost comical ingredient that powered the box. Instead, there was a grey green puffball. What's this? Martian cactus, native. My colleague Alexei Krilov gives fancy Latin names. Use here instead of potato. Of course, we grow potatoes too. Can't make vodka with a cactus, you see. How very Russian. I like this idea of how it's possible that there might be life on Mars, and it's, I don't know, it's quite complicated. It makes a lot of sense if you've read the books, but think about it. In our home reality, it was believed that life could be transferred between Earth and Mars, or vice versa, by the great splashes of meteorite impacts. This was called panspermia, the natural propagation of life from one world to the next. But in the gap, well, there's no originating Earth, but for the last few million years, at least there have been stepping sapients. And every time a hapless humanoid falls from a stepwise Earth into the gap, it may be destroyed by the vacuum, but some of the freight of microorganisms it carries will survive, delivered into space with so much less effort than a lethal rock splash. 
and some of those microbial travellers will survive to seed Mars. Not just once, but again and again. I like this little exchange here as well because this was what school was like for me. It's frustrating at school, Mr Valiente, Paul said, apparently more puzzled than distressed. The teachers always make me wait for the other kids. Tom smiled wistfully. His headmaster says he's like a young Einstein, ready to take on relativity. But his teachers can't teach him beyond long division. Not their fault. Now, the only thing with that is that Einstein used to get really bad reports in school. I'm sure it was written somewhere like one of his teachers said that he'd never amount to anything. This is quite cool as well. So when they land on Mars and then they step, Frank points at the sky. That's Earth. We came east, right? The Gap Space Facility is one step east of the Gap, but there's no radio signals coming from that Earth up there. No lights on the dark side. If that was the Gap Space Earth, we'd see evidence of it, hear it. Sally tried to get her head around that. So we took a step into Long Mars, but it doesn't mm, run parallel to the Long Earth. Which I think is very interesting and then adds like a whole new level to the, uh, to the exploration, I suppose. And also it means there might be shortcuts in the future where it's quicker to go to Mars and then step in Mars than it is to step, you know, millions of steps through Earth or whatever. We have a reference here to the, to the Chronicles of Narnia, which I was reading kind of at the same time as these as well. So it says here, um, Dad was always more a tinkerer than a hunter, and he built a stepwise workshop for himself and dug a garden. I'd take him over there and I'd help him out, and he'd make up stories and such and play games. The Long Earth was my Narnia. You know Narnia? That's the one with the hobbits, right? There's here as well a... a a new take on the saying, you know, the better to have loved than lost. So it says, was it crueler to have lived and died or never to have lived at all? Which is something I think about factory farmed animals, but hey ho. I like this conversation between uh, Willis and Frank as well. So they're talking about Willis and his daughter, Sally. Sally compared you to Daedalus. I looked him up. In some versions of the story, he invented the labyrinth on Crete where they kept the Minotaur. Problem was, he didn't think through the consequences. Made the labyrinth so intricate, it was hard to pin down the beast if you needed to slay it. Not only that, it had a design flaw. With a simple ball of thread, you could make a trail to find your way out. Daedalus never thought of that. Is this storytelling going anywhere, Wood? Maybe you are more like Daedalus than you think. What will you do with this bit of Martian tech if you find it? Just unleash it on the world like the stepper box? You know, you and Sally, father and daughter, you both treat mankind like it's some unruly kid. Sally slaps us around the back of the head when she thinks we're misbehaving. And you, your way of teaching us responsibility is to hand us a loaded gun and let us learn by trial and error. Which I think is a great description of both of those two characters. Okay, then we get to this other world uh, and there's a snake that's... Uh, so it's, it eats its victim from the inside out. It burns its way in with some kind of acidic secretion. So they explain it here. I, and do you know what we found here, Captain? No free oxygen, I know that much. Water vapour? Good guess, but not just water. Highly acidic water, Captain Cutler. That's the story of this world. The oceans are more like dilute sulfuric acid. So are the rivers, so is the rain, and so is the blood of these creatures down below, the couple we managed to snag with drones. Why, you just saw it in action, as that snake thing must have concentrated its bodily fluids to burn its way into that protoplasmic beast. And that reminds me of the aliens in Alien as well. Like, they have acidic uh, blood. So basically, in the same way that our bodies are 99% water, they use acid. Uh, this bit kind of creeps me out here. The beast slammed into the hull, its whole body sprawled across the window. Maggie got a nightmarish glimpse of the animal's underside, an array of suckers and ribbed flesh and things like tiny lips that mouthed the window surface. She even saw some kind of liquid come squirting out, fizzing. She remembered the fate of the jellyfish down on the ground, and her skin crawled at the imagined touch of acid. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> And then they send the ship's doctor down to fix the damage they do to it. And I'm just there being like, that's a really bad idea. But nothing really comes of that storyline, though. Okay, and then Joshua f is talking to one of these kids, one of the next. And he's talking about this girl, Miriam Khan, from a local family. Met her at a barn dance. And he says, but the trouble, of, the trouble is, there aren't many of us around. And so we turn to other partners. Look, Joshua, I know you're less easily shocked than most. But that's what I think poor Miriam picked up on. Sex with her, with one of you... Well, can you imagine having sex with a dumb animal, a beast? I don't mean some bizarre high megas thing, a lonely coma with his mule, like mating with Homo erectus. Have you heard of that species? Fully human from the forehead down, anatomically, but from the eyebrows up, the brain of a chimp, more or less, scaled up for the bigger body. 
Can you imagine coupling with one of those? The animal thrill of the moment, the beautiful empty eyes, the crashing shame you'd feel when it's over. And that's how it is for him having sex with a normal person. And so they go and meet like the big group of them. Most of them sat around a heap of wood, canned and film wrapped, a hasty picnic. Two of them, both girls, swam naked in the small pool that was the centerpiece of the glade. And three others, two boys and a girl, were having noisy giggling sex off in the shade of the trees. It might have been any bunch of kids at play, Joshua thought, save for the inventive open air sex, and save for the way they spoke to each other continually, a kind of high speed jabber that sometimes sounded like compressed English, sometimes like the baby talk produced by Paul's sister Judy all those years ago, which Joshua still vividly remembered. Joshua could understand barely a word. I like this quote as well from this kid, and uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like this sometimes. Can you imagine how it was for a kid like me alone? To be surrounded by a bunch of upright apes with minds like guttering candles, and yet you had built this vast civilization full of rules and a crushing weight of tradition, none of which makes any sense if you just look at it, and having to act like you're the same as everybody else. Except then he found other people like him, he found other next, you know? And then the police come in and arrest them all, and I think this is quite interesting as well. And I love this, the way this girl gets her revenge as well, because this kid, I hated him, but... Joshua had heard of this kind of tactic, evolved by the Low Earth's police and military after three decades of dealing with steppers and their ease of escape and evasion. You did your surveillance. You went in hard, without hesitation, without warning, with overwhelming force. You immediately took away the stepper boxes from those who used them before they had a chance to react, and you made natural steppers helpless, usually by rendering them unconscious immediately. The theory was brutal, and the reality, if you were on the end of it, even more so. And, cuffed himself, pushed to the ground, Joshua was able to see who had betrayed them, those Paul had called my kind the next. It was Miriam Khan, who Joshua had last seen broken-hearted and running from the home. She pointed coldly at Paul. That's him, officer. Yes! Get your revenge! And then during the travels um, on Mars, they get what are basically dragons, but they don't call them dragons, which is kind of a shame because throughout we've met, like, trolls... And, uh, you know, all these other races, kobolds, elves. And then we get this little bit. Frank found himself staring at a screen image of the upraised carcass of a giant insect-like creature, taller than a man when it stood upright. Over a tough-looking exoskeleton, it wore belts and bandoliers containing tools, loops of rope, and it held a spear in three, four of its multiple limbs, a spear with a rope attached, a harpoon. All this was seen through a greyish mist, and the creature was pointing the spear straight into the camera. And it's convergent evolution, so because there were the same problems, even though it's on a different world, they came up with the same thing to combat the problem, you know? And then they hear this thunder, and, uh, and then Willis says, I suggest we get the gliders in the air soon. Why? I think I'm learning to read these guys' body language. They seem a little anxious. Remember how I speculated about what kind of predator could make a 250 foot long animal grow armour plate? That thunder that you heard a while ago? I heard it too. That ain't thunder. Uh oh. Meanwhile, in the in the journey on the long Earths, they find a world where uh, life came from two different origins. So, um, as opposed to like life on our Earth, which all comes from the same origin. Organic molecules aren't symmetrical. We describe them as left-handed or right-handed. All our aminos are left-handed. The aminos in the tree are left-handed. The aminos of the fig are right-handed. Maggie shook her head. So what? What does that mean? Max said. I guess a left-hander couldn't eat a right-hander. Well, it couldn't digest it, Hemingway said. They could destroy each other. But look what they're actually doing. They bent to see again. The fig is using the tree for support. You can see another detail. In their tangled up root systems, the fig pays the favour back by bringing nutrients to the tree. It's cooperation. No genocide here. Very cool. And then we learn about the, like, the beagles and basically... They keep going in these boom-bust cycles, so there's a big boom in the population, and then they wipe each other out, and then they start again. But they don't really remember, or rather they know that it's happening to them, but they only ever bother remembering military things, because the hope is always that next time they'll be the winners. And so Mac and his crew tried to treat that by kind of making them infertile, so they didn't have as many babies, so there'd be less war. And basically, the, uh, the beagles have remembered that. They don't like being experimented on. And then the explorers heading to uh, Earth West, they find the wreck of the Armstrong One. It says the crew were fascinated by the huge wreck as they hadn't been any by any of the natural wonders they'd seen so far. That was the Navy for you. 
And then they meet these, like, these people that are the next who'd basically commandeered the ship. And I don't want to go too much into it because it's kind of twisty and turny. Um, but they're describing them here. And this guy says, these guys are worse, potentially. Hitler had the charisma, but he wasn't all that smart. Probably wouldn't have lost his war otherwise. These characters are smarter than us. Maggie, I'd like to try IQ tests and such on them. I predict they'd break the scale. Def definitively smarter. And smart people can fascinate, baffle, like a magician bamboozling a five-year-old kid. And so they almost have this superpower to alter their body language to make people kind of feel and do what they want. And this is how smart the next are. Before the age of about two, the young ones will try to talk. Well, as human infants do. They gabble out stuff that's entirely incomprehensible to us, and mostly incomprehensible to the older ones, but not totally. Again, the linguists have analysed this stuff. They tell me it's like investigating the structure of dolphin song. These infant gabblings are languages, Nelson, meaning they, they have actual linguistic content. We arrive in the world with a capacity for language, but we have to learn it from those around us. Next babies trying to express themselves invent their own language, independently of the culture, word by word, one grammatical rule after another. Only later do they start to pick up the language of the rest, and, still more remarkable, the others incorporate some of the infant's inventions into their own shared post-English tongue. It's like an entirely new language is emerging, mutating at a ferocious rate, right in front of your eyes. There's this great little exchange here uh, where someone asks Nelson, Do you have a daughter, Nelson? The question took Nelson by surprise. He remembered the living island, a woman with a red flower in her hair. Probably not. Paul raised his eyebrows. Odd answer. And at this point, the uh, the, sh the airships are at uh, west 220 million. It says there were a lot more gaps for one thing, holes in the long earth that had to be cautiously but hastily traversed. Worlds with very exotic biota, such as a thin band of worlds dominated by tremendous trees. Trees whose slim trunks towered above the twains. And Jerry Hemingway's best guess was that they might be three miles tall. Their canopies, wonderfully, impossibly, higher than most mountains. Can you imagine what that would be to look at? There's a moment at which the trolls, uh, they're like known for being singers. They actually communicate through song. And uh, somebody, Jason Santorini, teaches them Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which I approve of. Then they find this like space elevator on Mars. And it's basically using this sort of, this super strong cable. And somebody says, uh, what if this thing broke and fell? Well, the cable would wrap around the planet as it rotated and cause a hell of a lot of damage. There was a novel called Red Mars. It's not going to fall, Willis said. And Willis is kind of there to get this technology. He's deduced that this like space cable exists. And then there's this moment where Willis has to choose between saving Sally or Frank. And uh, most fathers would save their daughters instinctively, but he kind of calculates and makes a decision on which one to save based on who's going to be the most useful to him. Which is a very Willis thing to do, but not what you want your dad to do, you know? I think this bit's really interesting as well. So they have an option of, like, destroying all of the next, and they wonder whether to take it. And um, Mac, ev even though he doesn't want to destroy them, he has to argue for it. And he says, The next aren't human, but the most damning argument I have against them is actually how close to human they are. They may be smarter than us, but they're the same physical shape. They eat the same food. They will need to live in the same climate. This is a Darwinian conflict between two species competing for the same ecological niche. And Darwin himself knew what that meant. He flipped over his tablet. I read all this stuff in med school back in a different age. Never thought it would apply to me. Chapter 3 on the origin of species, 1859. As species of the same genus have usually, though by no means invariably, some similarity in habits and constitution, and always in structure, the, the struggle would generally be more severe between species of the same genus when they come into competition with each other than between species of distinct genera. He put, ta he put down the tablet. Darwin knew. He could have predicted this. It won't be war. It won't be civilised. It will be much more primitive than that. It will be biological. It's a conflict we can't afford to lose, Maggie. Only one of us can survive. Us or them. And if we lose, we lose everything. And the only way we can win is for you to act now. But there's also a risk that if they make, make a move and don't kill all of the next, then they've angered them, you know? So what, what do they take? And finally, I just want to point out in the acknowledgements here, uh, they write, Some of the ideas behind the Great Leap Sideways episode, chapter 15, featured in The Science of Discworld by Terry Pratchett with Ian Stewart and Jack Cohen, which I've also read. 
So yeah, all in all, this wasn't as strong as the first novel, and probably not quite as good as the second novel, but it was cool to see space and to go adventuring on Mars. Again, the storyline continues to develop here. And so yeah, I am enjoying reading them, and I look forward to finishing off the series. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Long Mars by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of these books, if you read them. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.